Welcome to Cinematic Excrement and my seemingly never-ending quest to review every film that has won the Razzie for Worst Picture. And we have a doozy this time. It's certainly more well-known than Shining Through, though maybe not quite as ridiculous. Although it ain't for lack of trying, I can assure you. Ladies and gentlemen, and all points in between, prepare yourselves for Indecent Proposal. Released in 1993, Indecent Proposal was directed by Adrian Lyne, who actually has made some well-reviewed movies and was even nominated for an Oscar. Obviously, not for this movie. But while most critics thought Indecent Proposal was terrible, it still put butts in the seats to the tune of $266 million worldwide. Well, to paraphrase a popular saying, no one ever went broke by underestimating the public's intelligence. Michael Bay can attest to that. Although I gotta say I'm kind of at a loss as to why this movie made as much money as it did, even taking the public's intelligence into account. I could understand if it had a solid opening weekend due to strong marketing and then immediately plummeted afterwards, but that's not what happened. It was number one at the box office for four straight weeks and remained in the top five for three more weeks after that. What about this film was so enticing and gave it this kind of staying power? Maybe it was a lack of competition. I mean, it was going up against movies like Sidekicks and Who's the Man? Maybe it was the cast. Robert Redford had cemented his legendary status at this point, Woody Harrelson had a starring role on the long-running sitcom Cheers, and the box office hit White Men Can't Jump, and to me, more star was steadily rising with movies like Ghost and A Few Good Men. Maybe it was that shot in the trailer of a half-naked Demi Moore rolling around in a pile of money on a waterbed. You know what? That, that was probably it. Yeah. Yeah, I see that now. But apart from Ms. Moore Scrooge McDucking it on the bed, does this movie have anything going for it? Let's find out why the answer is no. Moore plays Diana, a real estate agent, and Harrelson plays her husband David, an architect. They got married at the respective ages of 19 and 22. Well, that sounds like a recipe for disaster. Our parents were against it. Were they really? Well, how dare they exhibit common sense? The nerve. And it turns out they may have been right, since David is a grown-ass man who still leaves his dirty clothes on the floor. Sounds to me like he just might not be mature enough for marriage. In fact, neither of these two are mature enough for the real world, as evidenced by the fact that they bought some beachfront property in Santa Monica where David can build his dream house. This ends exactly how you would expect. Their income dries up due to a recession, and they're staring down the barrel of bankruptcy but I'm wondering how they could afford this property in the first place even without the recession. The real life Woody Harrelson and Demi Moore could barely afford a Santa Monica beach house. How did an architect and a real estate agent expect to pay for that? I would say no fool would ever sign off on that mortgage, but I have seen the big short, so... Yeah, I can actually believe they got that loan. The hilarious thing is the people who made this movie seem to have no understanding of just how much this house would actually cost. According to the couple's lawyer, played by Oliver Platt, they need to come up with $50,000 to avoid repossession. That's it? $50,000? For a plot of land that should easily cost seven figures? And that's not even taking into account the cost of building the home, which still isn't finished. Even in 1993, I'm calling bullshit on them needing just 50 k but in any case, they need a lot of money, and they need it quickly. Fortunately, David has a brilliant idea. They're gonna drive up to Vegas and win the money. Wait, wait. I'm sorry, did I say brilliant? No, um, no, that's, that's wrong. I'm sorry, that's, that is the wrong word. What am I looking for? Um, what am I? Stupid, that's the word. He has an incredibly stupid idea. Surprisingly, for a moment, it looks like it might actually work, as they're up 25K after the first night. No, for real. I to tell you I love you. Get used to hearing that line, by the way. It's basically their catchphrase. Or at least the movie is determined to make it a catchphrase. Have I ever told you I love you? Have I ever told you I love you? Have I ever told you I love you? Have I ever told you that's not gonna catch on? Anyway, they lose all the money they won at the roulette table, which is amazing considering they won most of their money playing craps. And despite their losing streak, it never occurs to them to move away from the roulette table and go back to craps where they actually had some success. I generally don't like saying anyone deserves to be poor, but these people deserve to be poor. Somehow, these total losers attract the attention of billionaire John Gage, played by Redford, who asks if he can borrow Diana for good luck. Buddy, they just lost 25k. Are you sure you're gonna get good luck from her? What do we got to lose? I think that's what their agents told them when they signed on for this movie. 
And of course, what does Gage do? He takes them to the craps table because his mama didn't raise no fool. And sure enough, they start winning. How about that? And to celebrate, Gage hooks them up with a nice hotel room and invites them to a party that night. And I'm sure I don't have to tell you just why Gage is being so nice to them. Even if you've never seen this movie, I'm sure you've all at least heard of the premise. And Gage is indeed about to make his titular indecent proposal. One million dollars for one night with Diana. Now the night would come and go, but the money could last a lifetime. A lifetime? Gage, they just lost 25,000 in one night. Do the math. Now you might be wondering why Gage would make such an offer in the first place. After all, the man has more money than God and could have any woman he wanted. And even if he has to pay for sex, there are actual prostitutes in Nevada. In some parts of the state, it's even legal. So why Diana? What is it that is so desirable about this young, unemployed real estate agent? Well, here's the thing. You see, I have no idea. I mean, sure, she's attractive, but that's really all she has going for her at this point. There are plenty of other attractive women out there, and a good number of them aren't married. So why does it have to be Diana? Your guess is as good as mine, folks. Of course, Dave and Di are initially appalled by the offer. After all, there are some things money just can't buy. You can't buy people. Oh, sure you can. They're called senators. But after sleeping on it, they realize they're flat broke and have literally no other way to pay their debts. So after giving it a considerable amount of thought in a scene that goes on way too long, they decide to go for it. And the movie presents this as a serious moral conflict. But is it really? There's an episode of the old sitcom Mad About You that parodies Indecent Proposal, and in addition to being hilarious, I think they really nailed the absurdity of this premise. I'll give you one million dollars to sleep with your wife. Great. Yeah. I love that. No hesitation whatsoever. Just great. Offer accepted. And really, would anyone in David and Diana's situation not do the same thing? It's either this or they're homeless. Not a difficult decision, nor is it the moral quandary that the movie makes it out to be. Sure, Gage is an immoral asshat for creeping on a married woman, and their lawyer is, well, a lawyer. For a woman like Diana could have gotten you at least two million. So far, he is the most believable character in this movie. But for Dave and Di, whose options are take the money or starve, there really is no moral dilemma here. If she's willing to take one for the team and put up with having Gage's old, hairy, wrinkly balls on her for what will likely be two minutes tops, go for it! Your ill-advised Santa Monica mortgage ain't gonna pay for itself. Anyway, David has second thoughts at the last minute, which is, of course, too late. The appropriate time to have second thoughts was before you signed the contract, dipshit. And Jesus Christ, what is up with this editing? All these quick cuts are not mine. This is how it looks in the movie, and it's seriously giving me whiplash. And what is up with this soundtrack? <laughs> This is just an assault on the senses. It kind of sounds like they took the score for the Terminator and they put it in the machine that made the fly. Well, after Diana fulfills her end of the contract, which may very well be the strangest double entendre I've ever uttered on this show, she goes back to David, who proceeds to smear her lipstick all over her face. I... I can't even think of a joke for that. What were they even going for here? Well, now that the deed has been done, we're at the halfway point of the movie. And you're probably asking, where can they go from here? And the answer is... nowhere, really. I mean, that doesn't stop them from trying to go somewhere, but wherever that somewhere is, they don't get there. They find out the bank foreclosed on their property anyway, which makes the whole ordeal kind of pointless. But they seem far more upset than they should be. You just got one million dollars. That's plenty of money to rebuild your dream house. Just don't blow it on a couple of acres on Malibu Beach and you'll be fine. But for some reason, they are determined to buy back the exact same plot of land, which was acquired by, improbable as it may sound, John Gage. And that's just the start of this nonsense. He also shows up at her place of business under the guise of buying more real estate, and Diana is forced to work with him because she's somehow the only agent available in this office. And when she gets a second job teaching citizenship classes, he shows up there too. If he wasn't acting like a creeper before, he certainly is now. Also, how did he get all this information about them in the pre-internet age? How does he know where she works and where their Santa Monica house is? Did he hire a PI to tail them? 
I mean, Lord knows he could afford to do that, but it's never made clear if he did. And David starts acting insanely jealous even before Gage starts stalking Diana. And he demands to know what happened on that fateful night. Um, don't we already know they had sex? I mean, that was kind of the point of this whole thing. You had a contract written up and everything. I, the undersigned, hereby agree to knock boots with an old creepy rich dude for $1 million. Signed, date. And you got your $1 million. Ergo. I mean... What details are you planning to learn that you don't already know? Do you need to know the size of the guy's wang? How many positions they were in? Did she take it up the ass? Maybe he took it up the ass? I don't know what he's into, I'm not judging, but... What details do you need here, and more importantly, why do you need them? Because I'm thinking ignorance is bliss here. I mean, it'd be one thing if she slept with Tom Cruise, but Robert Redford? Ugh, no! And when he finds out about Gage's stalkery shenanigans, he gets mad at Diana. How the hell does that work? Another man is stalking his wife, and he gets mad at her. What kind of fucked up ignorant shit is that? And to say David has some anger management issues would be an understatement. Don't lie to me! You are trying to do! <laughs> I'm starting to see why Woody won a Razzie for this movie. And now for the icing on this cringe cake. After David leaves Diana for reasons that were no fault of hers, she actually starts to take a liking to Gage. When he shows up at her citizenship class and professes his love for her, her students think it's the most romantic thing ever because they have no idea what's going on, and all she has to do is point out that she's married and watch them all turn on his ass so fast. But she doesn't. In fact, she actually starts dating the guy. What is the logic behind this? He's a creep. She knows he's a creep. She's got a signed contract and a million dollar bank receipt that proves he's a creep. So why would she start dating this guy? Does she just figure, well, if David thinks I'm sleeping with him anyway, I guess I might as well. I think I figured out the problem with this movie. All of the main characters are horrible, unsympathetic jackasses. David has some serious issues with jealousy, John Gage is a creepy, selfish bastard who lusts after women half his age, and Diana... well, I guess her only real crime is having terrible taste in men, but good lord does she have some especially terrible taste in men. Oddly enough, the only character I actually like is the blood-sucking lawyer. At least he's funny. Well, hi, Di. Not here. Yeah, he's right here. You want to speak to him? Also, Oliver Platt is such an underrated actor. He deserves so much better than Year One and 2012 and Ready to Rumble and, well, this. To cut a long story short, David tries to make amends with Diana by using the one million dollars to buy a hippo from Billy Connolly. I could provide context for that, but I assure you it would not make it any less ridiculous. And Gage is so moved by this that he decides to make up a story about a million dollar club, implying he's done this indecent proposal thing many times before, in the hopes that Diana will think he's a scumbag and leave him. And here's the problem with that. He is a scumbag. The movie certainly wants us to believe he's not a scumbag, but that only works if you ignore everything else he's done in the movie. He was scum when we met him, he's scum now. And sure enough, this convinces Diana to leave him, and somehow getting out of this car instantly turns night into day, and she goes back to David. Well, isn't that nice? I give it a year. Indecent Proposal is trash, and not the good kind of trash. The plot is half ridiculous and half uninteresting, the characters are stupid and unlikable, and their actions are rarely believable, and I have no sympathy for any of them, the editing is crap, and the soundtrack is downright painful to listen to at times. I really don't know what anyone saw in this movie, apart from... yeah. But clearly they saw something because, like I said, it made bank. Was the waterbed scene really doing it for people? I mean, it did it for me, but I was 12. I was a walking sack of hormones at the time. Grown-ass adults should have known better. The film was nominated for seven Golden Raspberry Awards, tying it with Sliver for the most nominations, and it took home three. Worst screenplay, worst supporting actor for Woody Harrelson, and of course, worst picture. And I do have to question that worst supporting actor award, not because Harrelson was good in the movie, because, well... Don't lie to me! You were trying to do! Yeah, he kinda sucked. But supporting actor? 
He's in pretty much the entire movie. How did he not deserve Worst Actor? He certainly deserved it more than Redford, who was nominated for Worst Actor, but lost to Burt Reynolds for Cop and a Half. Ah, Cop and a Half. Remember that one? I do, despite my best efforts to block it out. That movie did wonders for Burt's film career. And by that, I mean it's a wonder he still had a film career. As for whether Indecent Proposal deserved to win Worst Picture, I do think it's at least worse than the other nominees, which includes Sliver, Body of Evidence, Cliffhanger, and Last Action Hero. Hell, I'm not even sure why those last two were nominated in the first place. I don't know if I would consider them good movies, but they were good mindless fun. Could they really not come up with another bad movie to nominate in 1993? Cop and a Half was right there. I won't argue with the nominations for Body of Evidence and Sliver, the latter of which was the Stinker's Bad Movie Awards choice for Worst Picture. And both were erotic thrillers, because everyone wanted to make the next Basic Instincts. Hell, the guy who wrote Sliver is the same guy who wrote Basic Instincts, and they both starred Sharon Stone. Hollywood's lack of originality is nothing new, folks. Anyway, I personally think Indecent Proposal is the worst of the three, and I'll tell you why. While Sliver and Body of Evidence are crap, they have one major defining factor of crappiness. For Sliver, it's the ending, which was hastily reshot at great expense and at the last minute, and makes no goddamn sense. For Body of Evidence, it's Madonna's robotic performance, for which she won a Razzie. For Indecent Proposal, I can't pin it down to one factor. The acting, the characters, the story, the editing, the soundtrack, it's multiple layers of crap. It's a huge friggin' crap lasagna. If you haven't seen it, normally I would say don't bother, but apparently a lot of people got something out of it or it wouldn't have made as much money as it did. So if you've watched this review and your first instinct is to tell me, you idiot, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. First of all, take a number and get in line. And second, I don't know, maybe it is worth a watch. If you subscribe to Hulu, as of this recording, it is available there, so it won't cost you anything except two hours of your time. Personally, I would rather spend those two hours doing anything else, but you do you. And on that note, we're going to press pause on the Worst Picture Project, and next time, we're going to do something special. And that's all I'm going to tell you. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and Hollywood can suck it. I really wanted you to have that hippo.